Hmm? If there's a lot, yeah, it's okay. I'm not. Not particularly fond of them, but you can introduce me. You can introduce me. It's okay. Neha, yeah, you introduce me. Good. Don't make it long and complicated. Huh? Just like two sentences. Are you? No, just say I'm a Marxist post-colonial feminist like my poodle. Oh, this was recorded. Okay.
Open would be better, yeah. I don't think there's a lot of slides that need darkness. That be, they aren't very good slides anyway. However you want, it's okay, sorry. You want to use this? No. Okay. So uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to today's talk on gender in the jungle. Uh, I'd like to introduce. So uh, speaker for today is Dr. Kiran Asher. Yeah, I was going to say take it off or otherwise I'll introduce myself. Just say it loudly, however you want. Thank you, Neha, and thank you very much, Sid and Gautam, for organizing the talk, and of course to all of you for coming here on a Friday afternoon, where I'm sure you have lots of other interesting things to do. So I try my best to keep you all entertained. Um, my talk today is going to be in three moments of movements. In the first part, I'm going to read uh, sections of my book, the manuscript that I'm working on, which is called Fieldwork, Nature, Cultures, and Genders in the Age of Climate Change. So it's going to be two vignettes that I'm going to be reading. Uh, second mo moment is, um, again, sections which I'm going to talk about very briefly, my return to conservation. I was a biologist, I was trained as a field biologist and left biology and went to do work in the social sciences for a long time. And then the third moment is sort of the current moment, my second Fulbright, which was from 2019 to 2022. Of course, because of the pandemic, the work I, that I was able to do was sort of fragmented, um, not quite as I had planned. So the third movement is going to be that. I'm going to read part of that, and then I'm going to last part, I'm going to talk briefly, because the last part, uh, the current data isn't just mine, it's also very raw, very recent. So I'm not quite ready to, to say anything definitive about it. So basically, the talk is about the relations between um, nature, culture, and gender, or about nature and culture, and we did a workshop about it this morning. So bear with me. I'm going to put on the timer, talk, try to talk for 30 minutes, and then hope to have questions. I might go over a little bit. I'm also not very good at technology, but I'll try. Got them. This is not working. All right, we'll skip that. Wildlife sightings remain markers of happiness for me, and 2015 was filled with deliriously happy moments. I was living and working in Bogor, Indonesia, and thus irresistibly close to the tropical regions that persistently pull at my head and heart. The year started with a visit to Kanha National Park and my first sighting of a tiger in the wild. The extraordinary year continued with a visit in July to the Komodos and other islands clustered around the island of Flores, just west of East Timor, and have a fantastic photograph, uh, which we might be able to see, of a Komodo dragon. Uh, I can't figure out how to. 
All right. So um, the excursion brought an embarrassment of riches, close up views of awe inspiring Komodo dragons, hundreds, hundreds of cuttlefish surrounding our boats on a moonlit night, moonlit night, tens of thousands of flying foxes darkening the sky above the azure ocean. The year ended with a return to the United States and a visit to California's Joshua Tree National Park and my first non-cartoon view of roadrunners. I was keenly aware of the class privilege that enabled these moments of thrill and joy. Ghosts of colonial history also whispered silently in my ears. Surely my quest for wildlife sightings had something in common with that of Shikari's tourists, photographers, since our various experiences of chase, discovery, capture, whether for sport, zoos or celluloid or death in the case of hunts, depended on the knowledge and aid of local guides and trackers. Sephia printed photographs of colonial hunts often feature rifle toting shikaris dressed in safari suits and topis, a booted foot on a dead animal. A retinue of beaters and bearers surround the hunters and hunted, providing inadequate testimony to how their sticks and limbs enable the hunt. In modern visual representations and experiences of wilderness, in contrast, the materiality of nature and the bodies of wild animals are enhanced and luminous, while humans and social histories are airbrushed out, made immaterial. At this stage of my interdisciplinary trajectory, I cannot not see these connections between natural and social history, nor ignore the ways in which society and nature constitute each other. But in my early field work on wildlife ecology in the 1980s and 1990s, these connections were present absences present, but unseen or unacknowledged. Gender, race, caste, nationality, age, class, geopolitics, infrastructure, seasons, and other factors were constantly entangled with antelopes, iguanas, fish, and fowl, and other fauna that constituted my research subjects. These factors also determined my access to field sites within and beyond India. Yet these factors, like an affective interest in wildlife, were hidden in plain sight, and presumed to be irrelevant to scientific knowledge production. Moment 1b. By the 1990s, nature humans, uh, the relationship between nature and humans, and specifically the relationship between environment and economy, were increasingly central on many agendas, as was evident at the 1992 United Nations Conference on the Environment and Development held in Rio de Janeiro. In the report, Our Common Future, prepared by the World Commission on the Environment and Development, which was written to prepare for ONCSED, it elaborated on how the problems of population, food, security, biodiversity, and habitat loss, and a bunch of issues related to the commons um, were playing out in these connections. The WCED's impact and intent on 1992 ONCSED um, remain subject to a lot of debate. However, in the lead up to and follow up from Rio, millions of dollars and myriads of scientific, governmental and policy endeavors were dedicated to addressing environmental development issues, particularly protecting biodiversity and achieving sustainability. One such endeavor was a three-day workshop, um, three-day working conference called After the Arc, Exploring Solutions to Tropical Biodiversity Crisis. It was held in 1993 in December and convened by a, Duke, uh, a team of faculty from Duke University, which is where I got my master's. They had convened a bunch of academics, ecologists, economists, political scientists, World Bank policymakers, NGO representatives to discuss the elements of biodiversity and assess the threats to this biodiversity. A former advisor and one of the workshop co-conveners invited me to represent graduate student perspectives. The goal of the workshop was to provide scientific knowledge to policymakers and donors about biodiversity, and particularly the importance of parks and protected areas for conservation. Partially funded by USAID and the Harvard Gilman Foundation, the workshop was held at the latter's 7,000-acre uh, plantation in Florida. Gilman, a paper tycoon, had established White Oaks as a conference and conservation center, where he was said to host important political and cultural figures such as Bill Clinton, Michael Barishnikov, Isabel Rosalini, and a bunch of folks like that. Neither politicians nor celebrities were among the workshop participants. But for us, the real celebrities were the reticulated giraffes, okapis, black and white rhinoceri, cheetahs, and other endangered and threatened species that had been um, that were at the White Oak Plantation and they had been they were there as part of the captive breeding program. The interior of the building was just as exotic as the outside. 
The opening reception of the workshop, for example, was held in a large cabin whose floors were covered with the animal skin rugs, with animal skin rugs and walls adorned with trophies and photos of hunts. With ethnic arts and artifacts scattered around it, the cabin resembled my imaginary of what hunting lodges of the British Raj may have looked like. Given US settler colonial history and the plantation's location on the Georgia-Florida border, it may well have been the site of hunts for fugitive slaves. Other ghosts of colonial past haunted the conference site. Like colonial hunters, its participants too wanted large parks and preserves for wild animals, not to hunt them, but rather to prevent their being hunted, particularly by those with too much melatonin or too little modernity. This sentiment was expressed openly by one of the participants, a famous ornithologist and author of many books who worked in the Peruvian Amazon. He got up suddenly in the middle of a workshop to proclaim his impatience at proposals of community-based conservation or ideas to establish buffer zones and subsistence use areas within reserves. With arms akimbo, he argued that the urgent crises represented by tropical deforestation and species extinction called for the removal forcible if necessary of indigenous and other communities from biodiversity, from biodiverse regions by green armies. He further proposed that the West could aid such endeavors through programs such as a Green Peace Corps and help resettle communities in capital cities such as Lima, where they could be sterilized to prevent them from having more forest destroying babies. There was a moment of shocked silence before somebody walked the scientist out of the room where he continued to shout angrily. There was neither acknowledgement nor disavowal of the scientists' crass racism and sexism. However, like proverbial elephants, they remain present in the workshop and indeed remain present in a wide range of popular disciplinary, interdisciplinary and policy work on environmental conservation and sustainable development that I engaged over the subsequent three decades. Social Darwinist and Malthusian accounts that blame the poor for their poverty and overpopulation for deforestation and environmental degradation remain common. So do eugenic proposals and ideas, um, particularly related to the most marginalized communities in the global south. So there are proposals to say certain kinds of populations are not fit and therefore the best way to deal with them is through sterilization. And these programs continue across the world. Um, they are not obsolete. That is, conservation approaches like development remain grounded in particular modernist and colonialist nationalist understandings of the relationships between humans and nature. Moment two. Oh, and I don't know how many. Sorry. In 2009, I returned to India on a Fulbright after decades of fieldwork in Latin America. This time I came as a social scientist and a development scholar and a citizen of the United States to explore how connections between biodiversity conservation, economic development and local communities were being articulated within conservation. So I worked in conservation until the 19, early 1990s. I left the field for a long time, um, studied other things, never really left the field, so to speak, but my focus was something different. This time I wanted to come back and engage with the conservation community again. Um, and um, I was based at CISED, uh, and really my goal was to sort of engage with biologists to see how they were engaging with uh, the issues of, of social science that I had been immersed in. What I found is that um, there is a lot of interest, and there was, like today, enormous interest in gender society relations, through, especially through a focus on community-based conservation. There was some attention to gender, which was basically understood as women in conservation and not as in the gendered elements of research in conservation, like the kind that I just spoke about, but sort of focusing on what is the role of women in natural resource conservation. But there was very little focus on the differences within and across communities. So there's talk of community-based conservation. And again, I'm talking about within the conservation community, right? I'm not talking about social science research at large or scientific research at large in India but within the communities that I looked at, particularly folks in the BNHS and in the published literature. So there was a little or no focus on the gender dimensions of political economy and state power in the analysis of environmental or biodiversity issues. And the methods to engage the social were still very much scientific and technocratic, uh, looking at sex uh, disaggregated data. Um, and I found that although there was a lot of critical social science uh, on the environment, a lot of environment history, conversations, sort of institutionalized conversations between folks who worked in institutionalized conservation, 
and folks who did social science was very, very limited. So I would have conversations in Delhi with environmental historians and the scientific community would be in Bangalore. But from what I could see, there was relatively little deep conversation between these communities. So just giving you a brief background of what happened in um, 2009. In 2013, um, and I think this is sort of a picture that was at the back, um, I spent two years uh, at C4, the Center for International Forestry Research, and the dynamics that I just described about what was going on in India were very, very predominant also in this uh, development and conservation organization, where again, there was attention to issues of culture and gender, but really no deep conversations. It's sort of like, let's pay attention to those as things that are sort of alongside or outside of conservation. So they are included in or added as one of the parameters, not something that fundamentally shifts how you think about these particular issues. Movement 3A, lessons from a return to the field. Oops, I'm going backwards, sorry. So in 2019, um, I returned, or 2019, I was supposed to return to India this time again with the Fulbright. And this time, what I was interested that I sort of had learned from my first trip that I needed to sort of focus a little bit more on what I wanted to do. Um, and I also wanted to go to a particular field site. So I aimed to build up on my previous project, particularly at a moment when there's an enormous interest. And again, there's a deeper and deeper rhetorical interest in gender and, um, and, and culture. And I'll read this part of it and then um, go back to the narrative that I wrote. Nature and culture mediated by gender and coded as concerns over climate change, biodiversity loss, women's empowerment, are re-emerging in the lexicons of states, multi uh, multilateral development agencies, and conservation organizations like ATRI. In the 21st century, as temperatures and sea levels rise, there's a widespread consensus that environmental conservation and development uh, and economic development are interlinked. Despite the wide buy-in for these interlinked agendas, debates rage about how to address climate change and its effects on the environment and human welfare, especially the needs of marginal populations such as poor women and indigenous communities. Bookending the wide range of perspectives are green development and post-development notions of social and environmental justice. On the one hand, green development approaches call for the incorporation of marginalized communities within existing models of development to ensure their welfare and empowerment. So again, you all must have heard of social entrepreneurship, you know, green capitalism, green philanthropy. So on the one side, there are those folks that say the best way to address these issues is to really incorporate these communities into nationalist, international, neoliberal development. On the other hand, critics of mainstream development models suggest that the traditional knowledge of women and local communities offers better social and environmental alternatives. These differing perspectives are grounded in different understandings of nature, culture, and the relations between them. And this is sort of the work that I do a lot and I've published a lot on it, so I'm not gonna talk about it. Um, I'm happy to talk about it in Q and A, but sort of, I'm just flagging it and moving on. So it's sort of the context of what I wanted to do in the six months that I was supposed to spend here, it ended up, again, thanks to the pandemic, that the amount of time that I could spend there was a lot, lot less. Um, and again, the time that I wanted to spend in the field didn't happen because of, uh, because of the heat, but I'm ahead of myself. Anyway, so the goals of my project was to see whether and how ATRI researchers navigated the labyrinth of scientific and politi political perspectives on gender and culture and its efforts. Because again, there is an attempt to engage it, but it is a labyrinth. I used the, the term advisedly, so how does it appear? and to examine how environmental and social agendas intersect at a field site chosen in conjunction with ATRI. That's what I propose to do. So in 2020, when I came here briefly in January, I was really lucky to be in the field when, um, with a bunch of ATRI uh, ecologists, including Ankila Hiremat, who coincidentally happened to be um, a friend of mine when we were in grad school together in 1990s at the University of Florida. So in January, 2020, I went to the Banli grasslands um, of Kutch, in, the, um, in Kutch in Western India to assess the feasibility of doing field work for this project on the gendered and race dynamics of environmental conservation and sustainable development. I was returning to the semi-arid ecosystems um, three decades after my first professional introduction uh, to them for my undergraduate research in antelope ecology. Unlike that early research, which attempted to study nature separate from humans, my current project focuses on the complex unfolding of nature culture among the Maldhari pastoralists of the Bunny grasslands. 
Livestock herders, Maldharis used to traverse thousands of kilometers with their cattle and buffalo in search of, um, again, you know, some of these slides are for a Western audience. I'm sure a lot of, all of you know where, ben, where Kutch is, but here it is. Um, livestock herders, Maldharis used to traverse thousands of kilometers with their cattle and buffalo in search of fodder and water. Their range is more limited today, but their cultural and economic practices are deeply intertwined with the region's natural history. Stories about Bunny, as colorful and varied as the clothes worn by pastoralist women, are part of the family law. Both sides of my family lived in villages adjacent to the grasslands, and my petty bourgeois and nomadic grandfathers frequently traded with the Maldharis, especially my nana. I had never been to Bunny. The family moved to cities a century ago yet had an uncanny sense of familiarity with the ecosystem, the language, the culture, which greatly facilitated my conversations. At least it did so in 2020. 2022 was a slightly more complicated. Perhaps not so uncanny were the parallels with the political economy and cultural dynamics of the Pacific lowlands of Colombia, where I have been doing research since the early 1990s. Time constraints preclude me from outlining the complexities of each case and the discussion that follows is necessarily schematic. Both the neotropical forest region of the Colombian Choco and the semi-arid desert regions of Kutch have low population densities. The former is recognized as one of the world's biodiversity hotspots. In contrast, the latter are targeted as wastelands, and both areas are considered geographically isolated and economically marginal. The predominantly Afro-descendant and indigenous inhabitants of the Choco and the predominantly Muslim Maldharis depend on natural resources for their livelihood, and figure as culturally and politically backwards. Um, you can see a very different narrative of Kutch. Most of you have heard of Ranustav, and it turns out that most young cousins of mine have heard about Kutch, not through Framerly Roar, but through Ranutsav, which has a very different narrative and a very different representation of Kutch. I thought I had removed these slides, but here they are, so forgive me. Of course, the conjuncture of each regions are very distinct. India's neoliberal policies, for example, were incubated in Gujarat and arrived in Kutch with particular ferocity following a devastating earthquake in 2001. Neoliberal um, reforms in India, uh, sorry, in Colombia happened in the early 1990s um, after Colombia adopted uh, a new constitution. And again, this is part of my long-term project where I'm sort of looking at these dynamics in two very different contexts in two areas that are really in some ways uncannily similar. Um, but again, I can't talk about that in detail right now. In the wake of the earthquake, this previously neglected region was overrun by a variety of state agencies and NGOs seeking to bring relief and redevelopment. Funding from public and private sources spearheaded both infrastructure of development, roads, public utilities, health, uh, health services, schools, mass tourism, like the photos I showed you, and rapid industrialization. Large swaths of land and coastal areas were declared special economic zones and grabbed by private corporations for agricultural, chemical, and energy development. Pro-Hindu nationalist ideology accompanied these macroeconomic growth measures. The effect of these new neoliberal governance and modernization predictably meant displacement and dispossession for the region's marginalized communities. To ameliorate these uneven effects, states and NGOs provided aid to revitalize traditional livelihoods, particularly handicraft and milk production. For Bunny pastoralists, this meant a greater in integration into the regional cash economy and the national dairy industries. And again, many folks from Atri have written about this. Siddharth and Ankila have written about it. Chetan has done research in the area. Ovi Thorat's excellent thesis uh, examines these, these dynamics in a great deal of detail. Providing food, fodder, and fuel, Bunny semi-arid ecosystems are a crucial factor in these unfolding dynamics. Ecologists and environmental conservation um, Sorry, I can't keep up with this. This goes to sleep quicker than you all do. Um, ecologists and environmental conservation advocates stress that far from being wastelands, grasslands are biologically diverse and key to the region's sustainable development. But despite the attempt to contest these negative characterizations, grasslands are being destroyed rapidly and literally paved over. They are also facing the effects of prior wasteland development, uh, which included the introduction in the 1960s of Prosopis juliflora, a fast-growing non-native species. Vernacularly called jungli or gandobavar, Prosopis also depletes the water table, displaces acacia and other native vegetation, and prevents the growth of local grasses in its vicinity. Both the native concrete cows and bunny buffaloes eat it. But while it causes illness and death in the former, the latter thrive on it. 
buffalo milk is higher in fat content and thus fetches a higher price leading to larger herds of buffalo and fewer concrete. Local communities also make charcoal from prosopis. Charcoal making. Um, and they use it extensively as fuel and for sale to augment cash income. And this, of course, has implication because part of the projects, including of ITRI, is to see what, um, how to remove prosopis and what are the implications, ecological as well as economic, of removing this species, uh, introduced species, which is ecologically extremely problematic, but now is being used in very complicated ways by local communities. The expansion of prosopis thus has mixed results. On the one hand, it destroys the biological diversity that sustains the socio-ecological fiber of Pani. On the other, it is a source of much needed cash. Realizing that eliminating prosopis entirely is neither ecologically nor socially feasible, environmental scientists work in conjunction with local communities to seek different strategies to manage it. And again, this is a, you know, one excellent example of sort of how issues of culture are now being engaged by conservation organizations. Local communities, however, are not homogeneous. Maldharis are no exceptions and are marked by differences in religion, class, caste, gender, and other social identities. While I cannot discuss the implications of these differences here, I want to flag that even as culture emerges as a hypervisible category in the narratives of Bani, women are becoming increasingly invisible. The recent invention of Maldhari culture and the assertion of Muslim identity and Islamic tradition mean that women are subject to more seclusion now than in the past. Scientists attempt to respect these cultural practices and claim that it is impossible to talk to women to gain their perspectives on their roles in local ecology and economy. In addition to the very real complexities of field research, I want to argue, the masculine assumptions of scientific research also pervade participatory methods, however inadvertently, and can further invisibilize women's labor. This was evident in a workshop intended to share the results of process research with local youth and to discuss various strategies to manage the plant ecologically and economically. The workshop um, that was held in Bani was led by two young system scientists who had been commissioned to develop an app for smartphones to model interactions between grasslands, prosopis, and livestock in Bani. Um, and the goal of this app was to, to assess the economic impacts, how different models would do what. The workshop leaders and local attendees, all men ranging in age from late teens to early 40s, focused on two correlations. One, between changing areas of precipice expansion, livestock herd size, and charcoal production. And the second element of the app was between changing herd size, charcoal production, and income. However, the app did not account for the differential demands in labor time that these two different scenarios would require. While no tool or model can account for all levels of complexity, this absence is particularly noteworthy because milking is done by women. A larger herd size would mean an added burden on women's labor. Women also play a key role in charcoal production and changes in prosopis coverage impact their labor. A discussion of this absence at the workshop revealed an old and common assumption. Since women were at home, they didn't work. Thus, differences in herd size, precipice coverage area, or charcoal production would have no bearing on their time. This was stated explicitly. So, as I, so, sorry, this is what happens when I veer from the text. Local men stated this belief explicitly. However, as feminist research on development has long shown, the tenets of development economics implicitly make the same assumption that women, especially poor rural women, are part of unproductive or welfare sector, and their labor is flexible. Subsequent conversations with Maldhari women, which was possible because I'm a Kachi woman who speaks Kachi, so I could speak to the women. And again, um, in the end, I'll talk a little bit about this, what I call a very ambiguous intimacy of being Kachi in the field. Talking to the women subsequently and, long to, and with uh, long-term researchers, it was clear that although the tasks of social reproduction are class and caste differentiated, they are unequally undertaken by women. Watching women work give flesh to the critical eco-feminist insight that the ties between women and their environment is forged through their quotidian labor, which is often hard and changes over time. Or as Donna Haraway drawing on Marxist and feminists reminds us, all knowledge is situated. And again, I'll veer from the text briefly to say, I'm bringing this up in the context of, at least in the world that I work in, in the feminist world, there's a resurgence of eco-feminism and, and local knowledges. And again, there's a tendency to romanticize the notion of local knowledges 
and forget, you know, sort of a, a de-emphasis on the fact that that local knowledge is very, very contextual and extremely material. So women have a knowledge of their environment, not just because they are women, but because they interact in very specific ways with the environment. Such insights are also a recognition and reminder that the pastoralist intimate knowledge of their cattle and grassland ecosystems are not natural or pre-given, but materially grounded. They steer me clear from the temptation to think of Maldhari women as green goddesses or as icons of post-development or decolonial practices. Preliminary observations from a short return to the field also highlight the many differences within difference, an expression I find far more useful than the term intersectionality that underlie how nature cultures are constituted. So within communities, there are lots and lots and lots of differences. Maldhari especially, again, a surprise, shouldn't have been, but a surprise to me, are really, really, really cost um, differentiated within the communities. Well, I do not mean to stretch the parallels between Afro-Colombians and Maldhari struggles, I find that in Bani, as in the Pacific lowlands, not only are nature and culture, but also development and resistance constituting each other. As with indigenous and Afro-descendant communities in Latin America, Maldharis are making strategic and sophisticated alliances with scientists and activists and advocates to shape their organizing and claim a variety of rights, including um, over their graze, grazing lands. Um, so, so really, Maldharis are extremely politicized and extremely savvy in the alliances that they're making. And again, those of you who work in Kutch know this quite well. Such alliances also unfold in contradictory, contingent, and gendered ways. Uh, and here, I'm going to actually jump ahead a little bit. Oh my God, oh, this is terrible. This is why I dislike PowerPoints. My beautiful slides of field research in Kacha not here. Okay. Um, I'll conclude and then I'll find them because they really are something I want to show. Um, so let me talk very briefly, this part I actually haven't written down because it's very fresh from the field. So in the first part of my talk, in the first two moments, I spoke about the gender dynamics of access and what was the gender dynamics of doing research. In the second part, I emphasized a little bit of the gender dynamics, but also on the gender dynamics as they play out in looking at women's labor, yes? This time I went back to the field and what I was trying to do is sort of, again, because of the complexities of doing field work and the complexities of doing feminist field work, my goal was to see, was it feasible to do long-term research on the gender dynamics of gendered landscape change? And what were the kind of gender dynamics that needed to be looked at and that would be faced to do research in Bani? And gender dynamics, I'm using this term um, in a broad way. And again, those of you who are in the morning, I think um, are going to be with me that I'm not talking just about my being a woman, but this whole series of terms that I used in the beginning, gender, class, caste, nationality, and how they play out in terms of access to a particular field site, and also in terms of access to research. So I wanted to assess those vis-a-vis -vis Maldharis, again, given the whole complicated issues of the gender dy dynamics that are playing out in Bani at this particular moment. Fieldwork, of course, never goes as planned, and this was not an exception. Despite my notes about, about I was surprised at the deeply gendered uh, uh, aspects of my current work. What I found, and again, I shouldn't have been surprised, but all the things that I pointed out in the 1980s, about how gender, age, nationality played out in fieldwork, these are very much at play in the field site. And some of the photographs I'm going to pull out, they're very quotidian. They're photographs of a bunch of us cooking, cleaning the kitchen at Rambo. They're photographs of us in the field talking to women with their clothes on. We don't have photographs of the women because you can't photograph. Communities don't want them to photograph you. But what was really interesting in this moment of gender dynamics is that when we went to visit women, specific, uh, one particular household, there had been a marriage six months ago. They came out, so Shifa was there. They came out with a whole trousseau and they dressed all, so that's 30 minutes, thank you. So they came out and gave us their trousseau to wear. And so there's a photograph of us in their clothes, right? And if I were to show those photographs in the United States, for instance, we could be considered very, local women, yeah? But 
In a different context, my showing of those photographs and my access to those communities, which would be considered authentic, was considered extremely dangerous by the Maldharis. And there was enormous resistance to us returning back to those particular communities. So that's by the Maldhari men, right? The relationship with women. And again, I, I'm hesitating about this. And as I said, I haven't written about it. This is a lot of raw data. I'm struggling with what do I do with this, right? Because what I was doing is assessing the feasibility. I wasn't, I didn't take, I took some notes, but I didn't take a lot of field notes. I haven't decided what I'm going to do with it, right? Because if there is a way in which we don't want you to have certain kind of access, there's a reason why. Something about culture is playing a role in it, but something about patriarchy is very much also playing a role in it. We seclude our women, we seclude you from our women, we seclude you. Do you see the, the dynamics that I'm, that I'm talking about? Dynamics are also at play, I argue and I saw, within conservation organizations. So making strategic alliances, including with ATRI, right? Conservation organizations make strategic alliances with their local partners as they should. They are sensitive to and working politically with local partners to say, we will do certain kinds of research. And if you don't want to do certain kinds of research, we will pay attention to your needs. Yes, that is an element of, but there is also an element of gender that plays out. How do you access? What does this parda and this invisibility of women mean? How does it play out also in terms of who has access to field vehicles to do what kind of research? So a lot of what I found out when I was in the field, I would go to visit the villages, but I spent a lot of time at the field sites talking to three researchers, three young researchers who were at the field site, and they were basically telling me stories. And as a feminist, I do two kinds of research. I do research on a subject and I do research on subject constitution or subject formation, as you were talking about. But in this case, I'm doing research on the constitution of the research subject. Yes, so there's a meta element in this research. And what was fascinating listening to them over the course of the time that we were spending together is the quotidian experiences of research that they had that had enormous implications on how they did research and what research that they could do. Who could have access to the vehicles? Which drivers was willing, were, were willing to take them where? What were they being charged? What kind of receipts would the organization be willing to accept as legitimate receipts for research? What research constituted as research and what research or what field trips counted as personal or social visits, right? So what, so again, this, as you can tell, I'm struggling to narrate this because this is a not, I don't have a coherent narrative about it. I don't think I'm going to have a coherent narrative about it. I'll have a clearer narrative about it after I probably spent two years writing about it because I'm a really slow writer. So what I found in doing or trying to do research on the gender dynamics is how much race, class, I'm using the term race sort of again, entre comillas in, in, in quotes, because I'm a Latin Americanist. And again, I've been doing research on race for the past 20 years. So I'm using it in quotes. I don't mean it as in black and white. You can code it as Kachinas, you can code it as Islam, you can code it as Gujarat versus Kach, right? All of these things were playing out. So doing the feasibility of that research, it really opened up a series of those questions and the importance of conservation biologists and conservation organizations need to grapple with those questions if they seriously want to engage with social research. Because these are very sticky issues, but they're very quotidian issues that play out in who does research where and how, yeah? I'm not even talking about sexual violence. Those are issues that are present in the field, didn't happen this time in the field, but there were layers and layers of things that were showing up. Um, and so as in conclusion, my preliminary insights into sort of assessing the long-term feasibility of doing this research tell me that what I have allowed to grapple with is sort of this, this two layers, right? the layers of engaging the differences within the communities and the layers of how organizations of research and researchers are going to be able to engage this complexity in relation to each other. So I'll leave it there and um, hope you all the last questions and I'll try to find those, those slides.
they're very, I mean, they, they, they're bad pictures, but again, it gives you a sense of what field work is like. You know, these romantic photographs are the ones we show, but 99% of researchers literally sweating in the field. So thank you very much. I hope you'll ask questions. Let me turn on the lights. Oh, and can we, I'd like, if possible, I'd like to collect a few questions because I'm long-winded. So it helps to kind of have questions that cross-reference with each other. Okay. Um, I was wondering um, if in the effort to kind of investigate the lack of access that hides social relations, it's also worth looking at when is access given and how performative that kind of access is. So instead of looking at maybe when are we not allowed to enter communities and when, when are we not allowed to interact with women, uh, maybe instead looking at when are we actually allowed to interact with women, when are we actually allowed into communities and how does that approach work as opposed to some kind of, is it authentic in that sense, is, is, is the access performative? So. Is that something worth looking at uh, in trying to explore this? I feel bad. I think my talk was boring if you don't ask me questions. You hurt my feelings. Broader question, right? You've been engaging with Atri for a long time. Mm. And so you spent time in a city office, you spent time in the field, you spent time with students, PhD and master students. Uh, so with your ethnographic, I wanted to notice about gender relations in general, but also the state of, and I've been talking to you about this for a long time, state of uh, gender awareness, gender knowledge, gender research uh, in A3. Has it changed over the years? Uh, kind of thing, it's a broad question. Okay, thank you. Mm, this is me as a filmmaker. I have always observed that I have no access um, when I go to communities, because I'm a woman, I can walk into the kitchens, I can sit with while well, you know, making chapatis in the chula, I can sleep there. And I have quite a lot of access to women. And uh, yeah, maybe Chetan won't have that. So there is a difference in the access that I have. I've also noticed that uh, maybe after a point, if I don't know about uh, why access gets why men come and say that you cannot have that access again? Is it a person like me entering uh, this kind of a space? I being representing another world, which is uh, I'm being independent and am I going to come with my own set of values and possibly change things there? So I don't know what, what your understanding of that is curious. I think I didn't see a lack of access. And if I did, then I take it back. I'm saying that all access is mediated, right? Access to all, to, to all research. It's always mediated through a variety of different factors. To, I mean, for instance, when I was first working in Latin America, it was very difficult to do that because I couldn't get visas. We have a very few bilateral relations. So actually as an Indian to work in Latin America was always a big process. Somebody with a US passport, it's, it's different. So, on the one, what I want to say is that all access to research and to all research subjects is always mediated by something. The issue of performative, of course, this is performance. Your question to me is performance. So I think that, um, and to some extent, what Jaya is saying is also, you know, when, when one is filming the performance of something as well, right? It's always a performance. So the issue of performance needs a lot of unpacking. But the short answer I would say is that all access is mediated. And what I'm arguing is that we need to pay attention to the mediating factors of that access. 
not to say that one is bad or good, but then what kind of implications does it have? Um, to Siddharth's broader question about atri, I mean, to some extent, I have not been engaging that long with atri. I have, but in many ways, the, the engagement has been, I think the term would be formal, that to get to this level of, this level of critical engagement requires intimacy. And my engagement with ATRI until recently has not been intimate. And the place where it happened was in the field, right? So, I mean, I could say that I had a moment, you know, I had a much closer interaction, very brief, if I may bring up Chetan, because, you know, Chetan and I took me on a bus from, from Ramble to, to, um, to Buj, right? That was a much closer engagement with a student than I have had at any other time. This engagement with master students this morning was was much closer. So this is just to just again to contextualize contextualize something. And I'm saying it because it's very easy to make claims about something based on a very formal or, or brief interaction. And that's that's um, it's partial. Uh, when I went to Kutch, and you know, initially I was planning to look at all of Atri's you know, sort of do, uh, I wrote a piece, which I think it's there in, in I was going to put up some of my publication. I wrote a short piece called Gender in the Jungle, in which we looked at uh, forestry research, and we did the research in a very formal sense, in the sense that we just looked at forestry journals and forestry articles, and how they were engaging, you know, whether or not they were engaging with gender, and then looking at what, um, how they were engaging with it. So initially, I thought that one of the ways I would do this research was look at, um, at Atri's publications. And partly because the few conversations, let me say intimate conversations that I have had with senior scientists at ATRI, I've felt a lack of intimacy or a sense of wonderful research, don't come and talk to me. Nobody said that in, nobody said that in any explicit terms. But again, as somebody who moves, a gen, we all move in gendered ways. So including in Bunny or including researchers in Bunny, interested in what I was doing, but not an invitation, come talk to me. I'd love to hear what your perspectives are. I'd love to hear what you have to tell me. So, so navigating, you know, I decided to forego both of those ways of doing research, methodologically, if you will, with Prachi. Uh, she and a bunch of other uh, student assistants that I had, we looked through Atri's archive to see how many articles or how much research was on gender. And of course, surprisingly, there's very little. Um, and, you know, I'm here, I'm thinking about gender and the, well, actually not in the narrowest sense. I asked, look at what's there and see what are the terms in which it's being defined, because part of my methodological perspective is, I don't want to define the perspective and say, did you do research on this? I want to say, what, how did you do the research and how do you define it? But, but on whatever terms, we found very, very, very little. We scoured the Sahajivan website as well, and there was very little. And part of this also, uh, it seemed, I don't know whether there's research or not. But I found that after 2015, the websites have not been updated and no information has been put up. I'm not talking about ATRI, but Sergevan, which also contains ATRI's information. So it was extremely difficult to access stuff that's already been done. And this is, again, at some level, go back, goes back to a different kind of access. And it's quotidian. Somebody needs to update the website. Somebody needs to make that data available. And I'm sensitive to this because oftentimes research gets done and then researchers come and ask people, especially in the field or other researchers, what did you do? And I find it extremely disrespectful. It's like work has been done as a good researcher. It's your job to first go and see what's been done, then go and ask people follow-up questions. Um, but it, I was really, I mean, I don't know if I'm surprised, but I couldn't find it. We spent a lot of time also in the Atri library. I know Shifa spent, sorry, not at the Atri library, at the Sarjeevan library. Um, Shifa was with me in the field and spent a day at Sarjeevan looking through through their library, and they didn't even have copies of their own um, their own reports, right? That they they have fellows, and the fellows do reports. So those reports were also not accessible. And again, I'm not saying this as a judgment. I just I'm just talking about sort of you know data collection. If one is trying to do research on research, then these elements come into play as well. You know, scant references to gender. That's because that's a state of uh, you know gender research in ATRI. Now, with no disrespect to women students, PhD and master students, ATRI for the longest time has been tom toming its uh, the, the ratio of women mm -hmm. to male students, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. 
But I, I'm saying high time you stop that. Look at how many of them actually do gender research. I have gender questions. But, and, and why should women do gender research? No, it can be men too. I'm just right, right, that. exactly. And what does it mean? Right? This is part of what we were talking about in the workshop this morning. What does it mean to do gender research? And that's and uh, for me, the biggest learning, learning from this morning's workshop, um, and it's always fascinating when I learn exactly what I'm trying to teach, which is why one teaches, right? You teach because you want you to learn. So I entitled the workshop Engendering Conservation Research. And pretty much most of the 22 students in the, in the introduction sort of said that they found the question sort of perplexing, right? That they didn't know what engendering meant. And so I was making a certain assumption about what they would say about engendering. And in the process of their articulating the perplexity to me about what that term meant, it made me think about how I articulate certain kinds of questions about gender. But what I was trying to say is that, again, I'm not interested in research on gender per se. I am very much so. But also, what does engendering conservation research mean? Mm -hmm. For me, as a feminist and as a, and as a feminist scientist, here I can claim this, claim this space. Or rather, here I'm trying to claim this space. What does it mean to do feminist research on gender? What does it mean to do feminist research on conservation? Mm -hmm. Um, in the slides that I took out in the morning, one set of slides was on what I call gender mad libs. Um, uh, in the work that I did at C4, where I decided to sort of look at gender research because they have, I think one of the slides showed, uh, let me go back. This, they have these beautiful, um, I think the biggest budget at C4 used to be of the communication team. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just their website's spectacular, or used to be spectacular before it dismantled. You know, C4 is now dismantled. Um, but they have, you know, these detailed documentations you can access, any document which you want. The books are open access. So one of the things I wanted to do was to sort of look at what, how, how is gender being operationalized in their gender research? And I found what I call a series of mad myths. You know, gender equals women, equal equality, but there's not a deeper critical engagement with feminists. In fact, there's no engagement with feminist scholarship at all. So um, some of the stuff is again in some publications that have come out. And so I didn't talk about it because I spent so much time writing about them to say, again, I'm not interested in saying you should do this, but if you've done this, how do you do this? What do you say? So it's sort of, again, a meta research where you go back to people's research and say, okay, this is how you interpret certain things. This is what you say is important. And this is how you, in, this is how you interpret it, or this is how you mobilize it. Does that make sense? So there would be lots and lots and lots of, like all articles would start with gender is important, power is important. But then in the subsequent um, paper, the focus would be on sex disaggregated data, uh, gender equals women, and power sort of clearly falls out of the picture. So, um, yeah. Hold on one second. Let's hold the silence for a few minutes because there are people who might want to ask a question and might not. So let's just hold the silence for a minute. Anybody else? Being uncomfortable is part of the course. What is it that you want to ask, but you're afraid to ask? What is it that you want to say that you're afraid to say because you might offend me? I'm not easily offended. Sorry? Science is a masculine field. Uh, academia is, a, I mean, yeah. Okay, Ritik, sorry, go ahead.
demand i beg your pardon you you may or may not take it as a personal affront to the research that you have done but at the same time kind of ignoring or sort of sanction ignoring in a sanctioned way the the power relations that are at play and paying you know your caricatured lip service to the notional identities that um you know help your work succeed are i mean almost hurtful to people when they have to consider their own work and recognize that maybe we haven't considered this or maybe we've actively overlooked this and i was wondering how you kind of avoid the pitfalls of you know strategically essentializing your content so that it's accessible and successful rather than true to what you want it to be there's too much in your question you started simply and then you went all over the place so go back what is it that you're asking okay, i'm going to give you a very personal example and the personal is you not representative but i'm going to say something that and again forgive me we have developed a degree of intimacy having spent 4 hours together in your case i would say be response make space for silence for your silence and i i see me in you because we both talkers i can talk my way out of a paper bag silence makes me scared my heart starts beating when i'm quiet but perhaps there are lots of people who are quiet whose hearts are beating to say something so i would start with something so small right it's not necessarily representative but what does somebody in your group have to say that they're not saying or what is it that they're not saying that they may not say and you can't make them say it but sit with the uncomfortable feeling that there is something that you need to hear that they're not saying does that make sense I mean this is not I mean I'm I'm I love high falutin theory but in my practice sometimes things are very pragmatic and whatever I'm telling you is stuff I have to learn again I'm a talker but taking the question broadly conservation as a field has to come to terms with precisely what you said will it do so i don't think so will it do so in the short term no in the last it came in 2009 and then again in 2020 sort of broadly speaking the same research um and do i see shifts not again from my limited interaction with conservation so, so let me okay let me answer as a gemini two sides of my map the field which is my favorite place to be i see lots of things happen happening in conservation you know my favorite times both times that i was in, in ramble i was there were just amazing times hanging out with both the chetans and and with field researchers there was a lot that was happening a lot of gendered stuff that was happening there was awareness of it but by the time it comes here to the writing part by the time it comes to the discussion part exactly what was happening in the 1980s to me is happening is that those things are considered irrelevant to the research right there is research that's important and then there are all these other quotidian dynamics the quotidian and the quotidian cannot be important it's social reproduction so how do you grapple with that in in research and again i don't have a formula for it but and i think atri would be a good place for it you all have a lot of students you have a lot of women gender you know women students um the few conversations i had with um with women students at atri about gender dynamics in atri they were they said well you know there is there are no inequities here there are more students there are more female students they all over the place i said you know walk around the senior scientists office and see who how many of the senior scientists are women 
and um, I don't recall the response, but it was not very satisfactory to me. Is quite. I mean, it's reflective of the you know broader dynamics. I went to an architect's office because I was going with a friend to collect something. It, you know, I can't sit still for 15 minutes. I saw, um, saw the architecture magazine, big magazine, beautiful architecture magazine, featuring all these famous architects as well as their works. No surprise to anybody. How many women were there? So it's, 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 it's really re representative. It's representative of the world we live in, right? It's, and of course, bringing more women in isn't necessarily going to change the dynamics. I mean, back to the question that you asked, right? It's like, I came, I wanted to talk to the scientists, but um, there's a limit to how much resistance one can handle. You, or rather, no, not a limit. Let me put it differently. Again, another way of thinking about this. And really, please talk, right? Because I told you I talk, which is terrible. Um, I mean, even speakers, right? This too is a replication of a certain kind of dynamic, which is absurd. Um, part of the gender dynamics is when you, as a minority representative of whatever, whether you're a Dalit, whether you're a woman, whether you're a you know non um, non native English speaker the amount of de facto and de jure resistance that you face from those around you takes enormous amount of energy. And therefore, it takes energy from the work that you're going to do. So in particular kinds of spaces, you spend more energy sort of like de facto bracing yourself, which is the energy that one could do, use to do work. And what I loved about the field site and Bunny, especially hanging out with, with the students, was at least the times that I was there, I know this was, I know for sure this was not the experience of many of the students who were there. But for me as a researcher, those moments were incredibly fun because I wasn't dealing with resistance. We were all sort of working together, asking questions, you know, um, engaging with all kinds of things. And there was a lot of, lot of banter and back and forth, deep conversations happening. It was not research. We were just hanging out in the field. Exactly the same thing had happened at C4. Um, the best conversations on research that I had happened to be in the cafeteria um, where we decided to have just sort of, you know, we just decided to have once a week to just sort of have an open table. It was called an open table where people would come in and bring up whatever dilemmas of research that they were facing. And so then people would bring in, you know, all kinds of stuff that they were facing, including issues of, you know, what is my role as a scientist? Why am I doing science? Is it accessible to people? deep philosophical issues that were showing up, which I think play a deep role in whether people stay as scientists, whether they leave fields. But of course, the only places that, that came out were in those spaces. Informal spaces, of course, which, I mean, they go into the formal spaces, but of course, those were not considered real research issues. Does, does that, when I start rambling, I have no idea whether that makes sense. You're always prepared. But the backstage is also performative. Different kind of performance. Yes and no, maybe. I mean, it goes back to, you know, yes, we had access to women, of course, in the field, absolutely. Kitchens, rotis, this and that. Um, and so again, the, the mediation of access First time is good. As a filmmaker, you're going, you're going once or twice, you're doing things and then you're leaving, right? And a film, I'm making an assumption here, so you have to contact, you know, you have to correct me if I'm wrong. A film to some extent, or a filmmaker to some extent, is not perceived as being two-way. In the sense that you take the film and then you walk away. If you go back, it felt like when you know we could go once to talk to folks. But then if you wanted to go a second time, you were developing an intimate relationship, which would involve then an exchange, right? So that then 
not only were we talking to the women and hearing what they had to say, but the women were hearing what we had to say, and there might be change on both sides. Absolutely. Right. So that first moment, it's, it's absolutely there in the first moment. But in the second moment of interaction where you're developing an intimacy and friendship, and I'm talking about this again in the context of, of doing research, you know, on gender as women, as women researchers, and again, as Kachi. So to some extent, okay, and, and, and this is where, you know, again, I'm noodling on this. I don't know what to think about it. As somebody, I'm Kachi. I'm not Maldhari, I'm Kachi. The kind of Kachi I speak is very similar to the Maldharis. This time around, that, that insider, outsider seem to be complicated. Because I'm Kachi, I can have conversations, but because I'm Kachi, I could also potentially influence more, potentially. It would require a lot more pausing to figure out where this is going. But also because I'm Kachi, then I can be subject to the same kind of patriarchy that Kachi women are, right? I mean, one is never outside of any relations. And I'm also of a particular class, a class that I sort of at some level downplay because I want access as women. Right. So, so, so then if I want to do that, then I, it, it's always performative, but again, what is it that you, that you're putting forth and for what purpose? Um, and also with, you know, again, there's a different layer of it that happens mediations with organizations and what I was facing in Kutch is what I've been doing for 30 years in, in Colombia with black groups. Uh, my work used to be at three levels. Now it's at two where I was looking at the construction of blackness by the state, by uh, black organizations, um, black sort of social movements and so sort of formal organizations, um, black movements and black communities on the ground. And so on the ground communities or local communities, usually black movements want to control access or want to mediate access, saying you cannot go to the field. Or if you go to the field, talk to these particular communities, because we are representative of this particular culture. So the kind of stuff that we're seeing, I was seeing in Kutch is very similar to the kind of stuff that I've been facing for 30 years. Or not, I shouldn't say facing, right? Navigating for 30 years in Colombia. After 30 years of work, my navigation is very different than it was in 1992 when I first went. Now my navigation is very, very, very different. Um, it's not gone, but it just works in a very different kind of way. Um, yeah, so these meta levels of research, this is part of, again, those silly slides that I had about feminist aspects of research. And, and in my department, which is filled with scientists, as in people who have degrees in the science, in the sciences, we're asking the kind of questions that you're asking, Ritik. Or let me put it, let me reinterpret your question as how would one do feminist science? And so those are the kind of questions that we're asking. What is feminist science? Uh, so you were uh, able to interact with both men and women who came uh, at Ramble uh, as researchers. So what are your perspectives on the kinds of topics they chose uh, and what their gender had to do with the topics that they chose? So uh, let me answer the first one first. The second one we're hoping to write about. Um, the topics... Is this me? Sorry. The topics that they chose from my understanding, um, these were the Thakkar fellows that I interacted a lot with. And again, I don't know how Chetan, you chose your research. I think you're interested in. Right. So a lot of folks sort of were coming as ecologists, they're interested in particular kinds of wildlife, but then there were the Thakkar fellows. There's a call, right? The Access Foundation funds a bunch of fellowships. 
And those, I think that they put out a series of topics that are interesting and important. And so they sort of ask, again, this is my secondhand understanding that uh, what students or what fellows are asked to do is to propose that this is what I'm interested in. They put into, you know, they, they, they apply, it's a competitive process. And then um, the selection committee then works with them to hone the proposal to say, this is the topic that, you know, there is interest in, let's say, um, the regeneration of biodiversity in areas where Prosopis has been cleared, right? Um, so I think that it has to do with what are the topics that have been determined as being important by Ramble. Um, and I think the Maldharis have a strong say in the matter of what is important. Um, again, To use culture as a proxy to say we can't study women is an old story, but I think that that's at stake in saying who chooses what particular topic. Um, and back to, you know, whether women or men researchers choose a particular topic. Again, I didn't talk to a lot of them. We spent, uh, a bunch of us spent time together talking about the dynamics of research. And again, I'm, I don't want to evade your question, but what I'd like to do is for all of us to sit and write about it together. So in many ways, these are not, my, you know, they're not my stories to tell. They were stories that I heard from the researchers and what I would very much like is for the four of us to sit down and write about it. Um, and in fact, I'm hoping that Conservation and Society will publish it precisely to kind of address the kind of questions that you're asking, right? Not in a direct fashion, but perhaps, okay, let me answer it in a direct fashion. Let me answer it in a different kind of way. So, the dynamics in the field of what happened during the time that they did research on whatever it is that they did research on have a deep implication for the, the possibilities of return for themselves and for the communities to let them in and what it is that they're going to do, including for myself, right? What it is that I want to research and what are my possibilities of research, of, of return. And this is not just Bani. This is true everywhere. Again, in Colombia as well. I've been working there for 30 years. And the issue of where I work, how I work, what I say is always a question. Is it a question for everybody? No, it's actually not. It's not a question for everybody. Some bodies face that question far more seriously than others. Let me say again in a material kind of way. I have a particular performance and affect. Hmm? Somebody said I look like a little girl, which I do because of the clothes I'm wearing. If I had worn a sari and didn't dye my hair and sort of projected with a degree, my age and my experience with a degree of gravitas, I can move around the space very differently. Does that make sense? So some bodies have a gravitas that is not questioned. So let's say if Siddharth, if he didn't wear shorts, with his shorts, he's undermining himself a little bit depending on where he's going. But let's say that if you wore, right, I'm using you as an, you don't mind, right? No. So he's, you're a good sociologist, so you know this. If he went to a particular field site with a degree of sort of, you know, Dr. Krishna, those bodies don't face the same kind of mediation. Does that make sense? And again, it's, um, one can play with the performance a little bit. One can play with it a lot, um, but I don't think you can evade it. So again, one of my favorite examples is, I mean, all interaction is drag. Teaching and, and, and talks are always drag. I'm performing, I'm absolutely performing. And to some extent, I'm performing myself. I've been performing myself for so long because I've, I've been teaching for a really long time. So for me, teaching is always performative, yeah? Research is also performative. I'm performing myself in a particular kind of way, but there are many, many selves that I have. Which self am I gonna put forward? For what kind of access? And some form of access precludes others. I'm being a little cryptic here, but again, saris and dresses makes a big difference, right? And we all do. I mean, I don't, I don't wear, I 
try to wear salwar kameezes in the field. Mine happen to be sleeveless because I'm going to die of heat otherwise. But you know, I perform modesty by wearing a long, long blouse. In Colombia, it would be the reverse, where if I wanted to be accepted, I would be wearing very different kinds of clothes, because if I was wearing a salwar, you know, like long clothes or long pants, it would give me. Performance is contextual, depends on the play you're going into, depends on the screen. No, uh, and uh, the script was written for us, I would say. So I was performing the script, you know, we, we, uh, um, Hital and I talked about it a whole lot because we went to, you know, we went to, I mean, She's a brutal field worker, brutal in the sense that like, she marched me to a lot of places. No, she had been working there for a long time. What I say performative in this sense was, and then I say the script was written for us is that, you know, whenever we went to talk, you know, whenever we went to talk to people, like people will ask a series of questions, the same series of questions, no matter where you went, right? So because I'm a Kachi, um, so I'm Kachi, where are you from? I speak to them in Kachi. But then still, where are my grandparents from? What do I do? Do I have children? How old am I? Am I married? Right? There's a series of questions. that. I, so that's what I mean, the access of, of performance. And, you know, honestly, I hadn't really paid attention to my family history. People talk about it all the time, but it's like you, I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't listen to 90% of what my folks say. I mean, I listen, but like, you don't really listen. You know what I mean? So, but then when I was going to the field, it's like, damn, I better listen to what, you know, like all the stories of the family. So I paid attention this time. And this time, what I paid attention to is what it is that people were trying to find out because in many ways, the performative aspect of these, the scripts that we were playing out were a way of establishing relations, right? You are here. Um, and so that's what I mean. And again, they play out differently because if I'm, when I'm very intimate, there's, whether I like it or not, I'm imbricated into a certain set of relationships. And those relationships have certain kinds of implications. In Colombia also, it's extremely performative in a different kind of way. I'm always asked three questions. You know, no sooner that I say I'm from India, they say, do you know Mahatma Gandhi? Do you do yoga? And do you eat meat? I worked there for 30 years. Do you eat meat? I worked there for 30 years and it's like, it's the same question that I'm asked. It's like, I've written this piece that I haven't published called doing yoga with Mahatma Gandhi in Colombia. Because from the moment you enter, um, now not so much because I don't have an Indian passport, but when I have an Indian passport from the moment I enter and somebody looks at my Indian passport, those three questions are asked to the remotest field site that I'm gone. I start with those three questions. That too is a performance, right? But a performance whose script is not written by me the script is written by nationalist narratives or colonial narratives of what we are. Um, what does this have to do with research? What it has to do with research is, again, people are sort of, you know, pegging you. And to some extent, a white researcher would not necessarily have to answer, of course, they wouldn't have to answer the same questions. Oftentimes they don't have to answer those questions at all because there are series of assumptions that are made and those allow them access depending on where they're working. I love Butler. And one of you, I don't think she's here. She said that the section of that she loved the piece, a line from one of my articles, which is actually a line from, from, from Eric Wolf, who's working from Marx, right? Um, and, and here is Butler talking about this. She says, we perform gender and gender performs us, right? It's a dialectical process. And Butler is not read as a Marxist, but her, her work is deeply dialectical. A phenomenology is deeply dialectical. So, so thank you for asking that question because actually that tells me why I'm talking about performance. That performance is not, right? It's, it's, it's embedding us in a particular kind of relationship. 
in that relationship where, where each side is then getting to know each other and then sort of setting the pathway of what is going to be, be, be possible in the subsequent interactions. In Bunny? I think that's part of what all the, the, um, the um, Tucker scholars have to do. They have to present the results. So all the results, are, that's also what I was watching. So my research was not so much on the Maldharis, but on the researchers researching the Maldharis. But uh, they all, it's a requirement that they have to present it at the Sangatan. But that too is, you know, again, that's a, a culture and movements are very political processes, right? So what they ask and uh, the presenting of results, um, it's an important but insufficient way of sort of thinking about interaction. Yeah. In the communities that I've worked with in Colombia, for instance, people don't really want your book or research results. It's like, you know, whatever. what came out of it, but also oftentimes people don't necessarily want, you, you don't necessarily have to wait until what came out of it, right? Sometimes people are interested, but I haven't done deep ethnographic research in Colombia recently, or at least when I've gone, now I go back to the same community, so I don't have to do this because I have, like now I have very, very deep, long relationships. So, so the conversations are very much like this, right? This is what my research is like. We sit down and sort of chat for a long period of time. Initially, they were also very much like this. So there would be long conversations. There would be like two, three hour conversations where people are sort of doing the, the, the interview process is two ways. So folks have lots of things that they ask about you and because you're asking of them as well, right? So, so that to me in some ways is one does not necessarily have to wait. And also the sharing of yourself because we ask deeply intimate questions of people in the field. Um, and I feel very uncomfortable when people ask me deeply intimate questions. So my commitment to myself is that I will be, I, I'm committed to asking those questions and feeling that discomfort. Because I'm asking them, it's like, you know, we ask them like, why should they share their lives with some random people that came from wherever? Um, so again, a way of saying, yes, absolutely tell them what the findings are, but that can also be done very, 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 early on um, of establishing relationships. And it's also useful to folks, right? Because like I tried to do participatory research way back when, um, or initially when I tried, right? It's like, what is it that you want? The kind of things that people wanted. And this is where essentialism, back to your essentialism, it works out in weird kind of ways. So what people wanted, because I'm Indian, there's a, there's a, um, there's a tuba that's called papachina. Um, and they, the communities that I was working with, the tubers were dying. So they like, oh, Kiran, since you're from Asia, please teach us how to grow this thing so that it doesn't die. It's like, if I touch a plant or if I go near a plant, it's going to die. So I can't help anybody grow anything. But, you know, so what they wanted from the participatory research was something very, very different. So in that case, sort of, you know, what I can find is an agronomist who can teach them about this. Me, I can't do anything. Or again, talking about essentializing, the yoga kept up again and again and again and again, right? So again, long-winded way of saying, I over, because now I've done this for a long time, I have to come up with constantly, uh, or constantly reassess the ways in which I feel ethically okay doing what I do. And it's always an open question. But for me, it's the ethics of different kinds of sharing, not necessarily of the research findings. They could be of those. But along the process, people ask all kinds of different things. And so you work that way, or at least that's how I work. Because I found that folks really it's sort of like, I ceremoniously took my book, and nobody wanted it. I took the translation of the book and nobody wanted it. It's like, it's a book. The ones are going to eat it. Okay, chai time. Thank you all for staying for so long. <laughs>